Cool. So, um, so yeah, the, 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 the topic of this talk is going to be enterprise Ethereum to that. And kind of with the same focus is work on Ethereum 2.0 stuff. So, um, we, we have a huge, um, R and D team. Um, and, and we are also currently building an Ethereum 2.0 client called Teku, um, previously known as Artemis for those who know that name of the project. Um, and yeah, so, um, the thing about Bezu in particular is that we really try to follow like enterprise standards in general, right? So, um, typically one of those uh, things that we, we we chose in terms of design in the beginning was was choose Java as a programming language for the uh, the client itself, right? Uh, we chose it logically because eighty percent of companies out there have um, Java developers and they use Java on their day to day you know, uh, business, so it made sense. Especially because we have several things that make it easier to work with Java in in, in Bezu. One of those things is a plugin system in which you create just a, a jar file. You, you plug it in, you, you copy paste it, I guess, or you send it into the plugins directory, and then you can start, um, 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 you know, basically just accessing inside information from the client directly without having to go through those other APIs. Uh, the other thing is that we actually work in terms of standardization. Uh, we work with the EEA uh, in, in collaboration with them co-designing and co-writing the specifications for the enterprise Ethereum. So um, for those of you who don't know, there's actually a bunch of documents out there that specify how enterprises should be working with the Ethereum uh, I don't know, network and, and software suites, I guess. And, and we co-write those. And, and obviously the Bezu client is um, compatible with them and, and follows them. Um, the other thing is in terms of licenses. So uh, Bezu and most of what we write in, in Pegasus and, and, and consensus as well, I guess, is 100% um, open source. We specifically use Apache 2.0 licenses, which are great for enterprises because it makes it so that they can really permissively use whatever software um, was licensed with that uh, license. Um, just to exemplify that, um, one thing you can do with the Apache 2.0 license is actually, you know, use a software that was that has that license, modify it a bit, patent it, and then sell it. Right, so it's super permissive. Um, um, whereas other licenses in the viral uh, category typically aren't so much so. So that that was a you know specific choice that we made. And lastly, you know, it's uh, there's production support. You know. So interestingly enough, um, there are companies out there in the Ethereum space today in which if something goes wrong, you can actually call them up and tell them, you know, there's a problem with uh, whatever solution you've built um, and they can help you, you know, so we can help you. Um, so yeah, that's, that was kind of the intro. I think it's fair to um, introduce Pegasus and, and, Hy and Hyperledger Bezu, um, both because they're, sort of sponsoring this this uh, my talk at least my time here and also because it will be interesting to understand how that works um in terms of what we're doing in the enterprises not boring space in the privacy scaling and provisioning uh, space as well and so the contents for this uh the following slides are just going to be like a sort of like an intro on why i think it's not boring um talk a little bit about privacy and scaling um in terms of what's being done today in those uh, areas and then kind of use the permissioning use case as a, an example of what you can do with um, non-boring tech on Ether enterprise Ethereum and all that with a friend with the, with the help of our friend here Fred in the corner um, so so yeah so as we mentioned so there is a, a lot of you know tribalism and and there are lots of I think, um, undeserved comments or, or visions of what enterprise Ethereum is in the space. And, um, and I personally am of the opinion that the chasm that we're looking at today, I think, um, in which the technology is sort of ready, but it's not being ado adopted by, by like many, many people, um, can massively change if we started to have more enterprise uh, usage and representation in the space. I, in fact, think 
that, and although this is kind of controversial, I do think that we, we won't get to that mass adoption from just people using peer-to-peer -peer tools um, through the blockchain or Ethereum ecosystem. Um, I think most of the use cases and the uses, the future uses of the blockchain and Ethereum technology in the future is going to be just kind of like applications or, or you know, services that other businesses are going to build and that normal people, and by normal, I mean people not listening to this talk today, <laughs> um, are going to start using, right? So a sort of like a B2B to C model instead of a direct um, C to C model, which you know, you could argue is the Ethereum um, model. So um, I, I think that that it isn't necessarily bad. I think there are specific use cases in the world in which a user needs to have that direct peer-to-peer -peer usage. If you're dealing with your own money, of course, uh, why not? I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people. Uh, I, I love the Ethereum ecosystem and, and the values behind it. But there are other use cases out there that definitely don't necessarily need that much um, trustlessness, right? Um, I think it, it's, it's sort of a bridge as well. Um, there's many, these are some of the reasons why the internet started to get mass adopted back in the early 90s. Um, I remember specifically um, Netscape um, coming out and, and, and really enabling people to use the internet as a normal service that everybody could use. Um, and I think that today we're at a point in these ecosystems, in, in, in the Ethereum eco ecosystem, in which we haven't found or invented our Netscape yet. And, um, and possibly, if we do so, that's possibly going to be done by a business or an enterprise in the future. I don't think necessarily that it's going to be um, the, the way we imagine things today, ideally. Um, and I also think it's a bridge in terms of what we're going to get in the future, right? So um, right now, um, it, I think it's completely normal for, for us to imagine that that's going to be the, the status quo in a, in, a, in, a, in a year or so. And then in the, in the far future or, you know, after that point, we'll get into this fully decentralized system in which we don't need those intermediaries, right? But um, I think it's just realistic to think that we do need their help somehow. Um, another thing to note, I guess, is that, uh, you know, Enterprise Ethereum isn't only permissioned or private networks. There are many use cases out there that involve, in one way or another, um, main Ethereum. And um, I think there's there's space to grow that specifically in we we think um there's there's several companies in the world that are already working on this that already have shown um, their interest in the mainnet space that have advocated for that mainnet usage um you know just to mention a couple ey and and, and microsoft and, and consensus um recently announced a baseline which is uh, really interesting because it actually um has something to do with um, the last topic of the conversation. And um, and I think um, th there's a lot of space to grow in there and people usually tend to um, aggregate, you know, and, and think immediately about uh, private chains and permission chains when they think about business use cases, which isn't always the case. Um, and um, there's also a huge, huge amount and wide variety of solutions out there, right? And there's a lot of stuff to do, both in the permission space and in the public mainnet space. And there's a million, million things that I think we haven't thought about yet, right? And so that's obviously um, something to keep in mind and for developers to just open their minds and, and start to look at these other use cases and possibly invent something in that space. I think there's, there's a lot of fun stuff to do in the, in the future. Um, lastly, Ethereum 2.0 services are a, you know, I think a huge opportunity for the space to kind of um, marry those two things together in the sense that um, I do think it's going to produce a lot of business opportunities. Typically, one of those would be um, Ethereum staking as a service, for example, um, which in and itself is, is interesting, I think. But also what I think is most interesting is that it's, it, it could eventually produce a snowfall, a snowball effect in which 
the companies that are staking are going to be already are, are obviously going to have a stake in the system already. So they might eventually, um, from that uh, reasoning, start building on top of the network. And so we're not only going to gain in in, in terms of security, but we're also going to gain in terms of of um, potential future use cases, etc. So uh, I do think there's an interesting uh, potential for Ethereum 2.0 in terms of uh, um, Ethereum Enterprise. Um, so in terms of privacy, there's there's several different types of privacy or privacy solutions um, being built today currently in in different blockchain. Uh, networks and in diff by different projects out there. So there's private channels, point-to-point -point privacy, multi-party computation, zero knowledge proofs, and privacy groups. Um, but most of these solutions you can divide into two main groups, right? Off-chain and on-chain privacy. And, and again, as was uh, mentioned in the last uh, presentation, there is definitely a lot of potential use cases for on-chain, uh, or sorry, for off-chain um, um, work being done in the network. And I don't think everything has to be on-chain. I think there's many, many potential use cases in which we can use a mix of both on-chain and off-chain to achieve what we want. Um, the, you know, I, I just want to, you know, do a quick shout out to Orion, which is the Pegasus um, um, privacy solution. It's a private uh, transaction manager. Um, I, I invite everybody to go to github.com slash Pegasus and slash Orion to check that out because it really is cool. Um, so this is a, twit, uh, a tweet from today, actually, I think. Um, yeah, April 4th, you can see here. Um, so from, from Vitalik specifically, and it isn't the first time um, this, I guess, year or, or recently that he's been kind of uh, open to enterprise Ethereum. And, and in this case, he mentions privacy in particular, which is, which is great. I, I invite everybody to look at that project. Um, I, I do think though that um, in, in general, and to be fair, I guess my, my, my title, the title of this talk is a bit clickbaity, but to be fair, um, I have seen a huge change in um, perception of what en enterprise Ethereum is and how it's perceived from uh, the part of the community. And it, it's, it's been, you know, greatly improved in the past year or so. So um, that's, you know, good to know and um, good to know that we're going in the, in the right direction. Um, so in terms of scaling, there's a lot of stuff being done in Enterprise Ethereum as well. And, and, and what's interesting is, again, that we can use scaling off-chain and then publish some of that information on-chain and, and, and so on. Um, what, one of those solutions typically that uh, we're working on at, at Pegasus is uh, ZK rollups, right? So um, the, the ability to basically prove a whole bunch, a bunch of transaction at the same time, and then um, use these really powerful computers just to make a one solid proof of those uh, transactions and then publish that on chain, right? Um, it's really easy to prove that that um, proof is correct, but it's really difficult to like, do, do the contrary, right? To, to go backwards, kind of like the way private, um, public, private key works uh, today. And um, what's interesting about those in particular is that not only do they improve uh, scaling, but they also improve privacy as well, uh, because we won't have all that data on, on mainnet. Um, so yeah, so if you will, that, that, that's kind of like the intro to the why Ethereum is, uh, enterprise Ethereum is not boring. Um, I'm, I'm not going to just go and dive deeper into one use case in particular regarding permissioning, which there's a lot of stuff being done in the enterprise world um, f through permissioning. And, um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, just kind of better explain how this works, at least in the case of Hyperledger Bezu. Um, before I start, though, I, I do want to kind of clarify one thing. Um, so the, the reason... And I, so Bezu is called Hyperledger Bezu because we're part of the Hyperledger group now. Hyperledger group is a um, is part of the Linux Foundation. And for those of you who don't know, because I actually figured this out uh, quite, quite recently, Hyperledger is um, sorry, the, the Linux Foundation is a is a foundation that promotes Linux to the enterprise world. 
not just to regular individuals like you and me, but really specifically to the enterprise world, right? And that's something I learned recently. And like I think it's really regular. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe not like you and me, but <laughs> or at least not regular users like you and me. Um, and and so that's something that really kind of. Um, clears things up, at least for me, because what they did was create under the Linux Foundation, the Hyperledger group. And what that does is promote blockchain towards the uh, to, to, to the um, enterprise world as well. Right. And so it made total sense for that, uh, the Hyperledger project, I guess, to have a fully mainnet compatible Ethereum client in the list of their projects, because there's currently 15 of them. And although I'd say maybe Hyperledger Fabric is the most well-known of them, that's only just one of the projects under the Linux Foundation's Hyperledger group. Um, so, so yeah, so that's just a, a small side in order to kind of explain why, um, you know, hyper, where Hyperledger and, and Ethereum, um, um, what's their relationship between them? And, and it, I guess it, it means that um, Hyperledger Bezu was their first um, mainnet compatible, um, very mainnet compatible project. So anyways, getting on with it. Um, permissioning in particular, right, is a, a system for granting authorization. I, I, I love looking up, uh, you know, just definitions before starting anything. Um, and one of those things, uh, I like you know, just showing these in, in, in talks is, it, I think, gives a lot of context to what we're talking about. So a system for granting authorization, right? And we're talking about blockchain, so it is kind of um, interesting in that use case, right? Um, so there's a bunch of valid reasons to want to have permissioning on a blockchain. Um, you know, this, this list, I, I actually cropped it out, but it, so it's obviously bigger than this, but um, we're probably gonna just be looking at that one there that's um, in, in orange, so identify, or I'm sorry, identity verification requirements, um, which would be one of the main ones. So in other words, like KYC and AML, um, I know lots of us aren't fans of those two things, um, but you know, unfortunately we live in a world in where those things are necessary and they actually do have positive um, you know, reasoning behind them. Um, it, it brings with it a bunch of negative stuff, but you know the, the reality is that we need KYC and AML, and um, we need to um, verify identity um, today for, for people you know, on certain platforms, I guess. And the fact is that we can't do that um, in a fully decentralized way yet, right? So, um, so one of the, the workarounds is using permissioning. Um, with Bezu, there's four types of permissioning. There's local account permissioning, local node permissioning, on-chain node permissioning, and on-chain account permissioning. So to the left of those green squares, you'll find the, the um, where to set the permissions. So either at a local level or on-chain. And then to the right, there's going to be the, the what you're going to be permissioning, right? So it's either going to be a, an, an account or a node that's going to be whitelisted. Um, so the, so here we have Fred, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, and he, this Fred, he wants to send $5 or five euros or five bucks to Charlie, his friend, and they're far away. And they don't want to send that through the, you know, postal service. They want to use this, uh, magical network called the Ethereum network, um, which you know, more precisely, isn't very magical, but it's a peer-to-peer uh, -peer decentralized network um, in which Fred creates an account, you know, 0x01, Charlie creates his own account, 0x02, and Fred's, Fred sends that uh, $5 to a node, and the node then receives, uh, sends um, that other $5, sends that $5 to Charlie. Of course, that's not exactly what happens, right? So Fred, what he does, he sends a transaction with a value of five to a node, and then Charlie can actually go and, and, and get that receipt from that node, right? So what would happen if we wanted to um, block Fred off from this network? Because as I said, um, he hasn't done his KYC, right? Uh, so one thing we can do is block that, um, uh, tell, tell that node to not to accept that transaction, right? 
And so that would be local account permissioning. And that's what we do um, on specifically that um, locally on that computer, on that node, we can actually um, de define the permissioning for what accounts can access it or not. So now node OA, which has now a name, um, is not gonna accept any um, transactions from account OX01, right? Um, but Fred, he's determined and he really wants to go ahead and he wants to send those $5 to Charlie. So instead of sending it to node OA, he sends that transaction to node OB, right? Um, so once node OB receives it, he, that node itself propagates that transaction. Actually, Charlie can even go to the same node, node OA afterwards, and actually receive that receipt, even if node OA had initially blocked Fred's transactions. So if we wanted to block node OA from receiving propagating transactions or any kind of transactions from node OB, we can do that as well, right? And so we can also, at a local level, um, we can define what nodes um, can talk to our nodes or not, right? So in this case, um, we've actually, sorry, we've actually um, separated, I guess, nodes, node B and node A's communication, but again, node B can still send a transaction to node C and even node D, and then that will propagate as well and eventually arrive to node A's um, as well, and, and, and even further arrive to Charlie's wallet, right? Um, so what we can do in that case is add a node permissioning data to the actual chain, right? Um, and, and, and that way we can block node B from the chain itself and from all other nodes. And so that's what on-chain node permissioning is specifically. So again, um, as local permissioning was just defining the permissionings on uh, the permissions on a specific local machine, um, hardware-wise, I guess you can you can you can go on to their, the the basal config and, and and modify those permissions. Um, On-chain node permissioning is going to modify uh, permissions at a chain level. So the, the permissions are going to be shared through a smart contract, um, or, or sorry, shared through the blockchain and updated through a smart contract that everybody has access to, every node has access to. So at that point, we've actually um, really kind of isolated node B from interacting with our network. So um, bravo, we were done, right? But no, of course, um, Fred can just send that to another node, node C in this case. Um, he doesn't need to talk to node B specifically. In fact, node B was probably his own node in, from the beginning, um, but he can very well just send that transaction of value five to node C or another node, any other node, and that'll get processed, right? So obviously that's when account permissioning data gets added to that chain. And that's what on-chain account permissioning is. So uh, same way, um, if you wanna block specific, or rather if you wanna whitelist, <clears throat> sorry, specific um, users or accounts from your network, you can just um, update those permissions on that smart contract, update the world state, and whenever your node gets that updated world state, it's going to be updated completely like, on the whole network, both in terms of nodes and accounts. And so in that case, Fred is completely, um, I guess, isolated and blocked off from the network, and, and so is a node OB. So Charlie was never going to get his uh, $5, unfortunately. Um, so that's the end of our little story here. And the, the, the way that works more specifically is, um, so again, mentioning the EA and, and the specifications that they defined, um, this is how the account permissioning is implemented itself. So super simple, actually. It's an interface that has, um, you know, the, the sender, the target and, um, and not much other. And, and then with that, you can create a list of, uh, a wait list of accounts that can actually access your, your network, right? And more so, you can even go further and, and use that in order to wait list it for specific things in your network, right? Like uh, specific accounts or methods. Um, Likewise, uh, the, the on-chain node specification is actually quite simple. There's a couple of more you know, details in there. The, the, the one thing to note is that the source e-node high and low are just basically, um, it, it's, it's, 
the inode address divided in two because it's too long to fit into a bytes 32 um, um, data value. And, and then the rest is just basically the IP and the port. So again, the whole the first four elements here and the second four elements are, are two different nodes. So I'm um, just identifying what nodes can talk to each other, right? Um, and a small um, detail on this as well is that, um, so the EA on-chain node spec actually has 32 bytes in it. And um, today there's only just one of them used, which is that very first byte. So it's either a, you know, a zero or a one. If it's zero, you don't have access to whatever uh, you're asking for. And if it's one, you do have access for it. And the rest are reserved for future uses. Um, that's it actually for me. So uh, th th there's more docs um, and examples and videos in these links, because believe it or not, <laughs> those things without uh, underlying underlining um, text are links. Um, I'll be sending the link to this presentation itself, um, which I should have done in the beginning, um, through the chat so that everybody can access it. It's open publicly. There you go. And um, feel free to, to check out those, <clears throat> those links and um, give us feedback. And obviously, I'm here for questions as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to just kind of speak to the enterprise Ethereum is not boring subject in general and not specifically about permissioning if anybody wants to. Um, let's see. Um, Stefan Starflinger from, from Bitfly uh, shouted out. Uh, the the team today actually so we were we were talking I was asking because they're building the Beacon Chain Explorer the 2.0 Beacon Chain Explorer um, I actually he, just checked that out uh, recently it was, it's awesome it's a great project yeah oh wow and you got to when we have the talk online you got to go back and watch his talk because it's so it's just so straight up organized and just so so dynamic uh, so dynamically awesome what they've been building man <laughs> it, it, it's really great. Um, so we were talking about the different uh, ETH 2.0 um, implement, implementation teams. So it would be really cool to have that also, since since uh, since you guys are building one of the the implementations to to give your point of view about the ETH 2.0 um, implementation that you guys are working on. Yeah, that makes total sense. Actually, in in fact, the. the... The fact is, th there's going to be different clients for different use cases, right? Um, Teku is a enterprise-focused client, as is Bezu. Um, so the the fact is that we should probably get all these teams talking to each other and 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 understanding what the best course of action is, like generally speaking, right? For all the different use cases, as many as possible. All right. Anyways, thanks everybody, and uh, thanks for your time and uh, um, great conversation. See you around.